you know, I don't have much money, but I'm going to spend the last of the money I do have pressing up some sub seven inches and hopefully I will sell enough of them to get my money back. And if I don't, well, then I'll just be broker than I was before and everybody will laugh at me, but whatever. And so that was probably the biggest risk right there. I mean, in fact, it was. I mean, it's, it's kind of a miracle that I survived the first year. Yeah, after that, everything went pretty easy, actually. I actually went pretty easy as soon as as soon as those records came out. I mean, it was just uh, it was just kind of magic that the people wanted to hear them and they wanted to buy them. And uh, you, you know, the people who had all told me I was an idiot for doing this, uh, they were kind of like, eh, you know, you must be doing some kind of shady thing or something <laughs> thing or whatever, uh, you know. That stuff's not really punk. You know, there was a lot of that because we were diverging. I think one of you uh, might have been you over in the corner. Uh, one asked earlier if it was a reaction against the hardcore bands, but it definitely was because in the eight, mid 80s, punk was largely about real macho, hardcore, often violent bands and, and often crossover with uh, metal bands none of which I particularly enjoyed at all. And to me, that all seemed like old people's music. Uh, I thought one of the big things that Lookout had going for it was that our music was happy and bouncy and fun and young kids liked it. And it was kind of like a big selling point with the, with the younger kids. Like they, they, they don't like, you know, kids like 14, 15, 16, they don't want to be have their big brother be like, dude, you should listen to this. This is like really shreds. You know, like they want to have their own music. And because we had all these like cartoon images and like silly ads and stuff, they could relate to that. That was like very kid-like. And they were like, ah, I don't have to listen to my big brother, my gnarly old big brother's music. I, got my, I can have my own music now. And I think I'll start a band and play that kind of music too. And you know, so it kind of built upon itself. But yeah, the the old the older punks and some of which I'm talking about are literally like old as in 18 or 19. But they a lot of them kind of got really annoyed because we were too silly, we, we weren't mean and angry enough. There you go. For many of us, you know, like you said, we we are a bit younger, so we've come into a different generation, and you know, Green Day was the gateway for a lot of us. You know, brought us in and moved us from new to old you know like i found a lot of the old punk that i listen to now because of green day and i think there's a lot of debate out there whether or not they're quote unquote punk uh, do you think there's an unnecessary divide between uh, that's, um, the old and the new unless you're really bored and have a lot of time on your hands and nothing else to do i mean it's completely unnecessary debate or divide or whatever uh, Funny, a couple, I mean, you mentioned about how Green Day led a lot of you to find uh, old music, uh, classic punk or whatever. Uh, the, what, what a lot of people probably don't know is that it led Green Day to, <laughs> to do that too. That when they were kids, they didn't, they didn't know most of the, of the, the I, I, I don't want to call them, um, I suggest that they're not being totally honest, but they often in the interviews and list off all these classic uh, bands that influenced them. I'm not sure that all of that's completely true. I think uh, I think they discovered a lot of those bands themselves once they started hanging around at Gilman, and especially once they started playing music with with Al Sabrante from Isocracy, because he was two years older than Billy and Mike, and I think he turned them on to a lot of new, well, new old music, classic music, because. Again, I don't, uh, people, a lot of people know this, but a lot don't. For a couple years before Sweet Children and then Green Day, they had been trying to start a band. And basically, it was like a, a, a metal band. Uh, they had a band called Blood Rage, I think it was. I, 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 I hope I'm not remembering that wrong. It was something similarly ridiculous, if that wasn't it. And it was just like very, and they, they came from the part of the East Bay where some of the, where like Metallica and uh, Exodus and some of that kind of metal stuff came from. 
that's what, as kids, that's what they grew up, you know, looking at. And they, they, they like, for instance, they spent like a huge amount of money for, for, for 14 or 15 year olds doing this professional demo tape of them playing this kind of metal type music, assuming it was going to get them signed to a big label. And of course, it got them nothing. And then they play this, uh, you know, little uh, show in a cabin in the middle of no place and cost them gas money to get there. And that's about it. And next thing you know, they're, they're selling a couple million records. I mean, literally, we sold a, a million of each of their first two records. And, um, you know, I, this was the message I was always trying to give to, to, to kids and wanted to be in bands. And, See, you don't have to go the old-fashioned way, the commercial way. You can you can find your own way and make your own way. But I, I guess I'm getting a little bit off topic. But um, the point is, you know, there, whether you like Green Day's music currently or not, um, you know, f I mean, I knew them from the beginning and for the first seven years or so, I mean, you could not get a much more punk band. I mean, maybe they were, like Tim Johanna didn't think they were punk. He thought they were pop. But, you know, pop is short for popular, and they were definitely not popular for the first few years. I mean, except they had like a, a few hundred fans at Gilman, and that was about it. Uh, it took a while to get fans anywhere else. Um, but they lived they lived in a, a hovel, I mean, like, and that put most, that made most punk houses look like a mansion. They toured in a broken down old van. They slept on floors and in backyards all over the country. They did all of the stuff that punks are supposed to do, and they did it all from the ground up. There, you know, they came. You know, Mike and Billy come from very poor working class families. They didn't have a lot of money to spend on guitars and amps and all of that kind of stuff. They just, you know, they made their own way. And I mean, that's always what I thought punk was about. And, you know, whether you like, you know, Beatles type music, which is what I kind of associated their early stuff with. Well, you know, the Beatles in their early days were kind of punk too. They, they lived that same way. They, they kind of lived on no money and slept on floors and played any place that somebody would let them play. And they kept up and they kept at it. And eventually a lot of people decided, yeah, I kind of like that. <laughs> and so it was quite a special event for me, you know, as being somebody from an earlier generation who saw the Beatles when they first came on TV in 1964 and watched that whole thing and owned all their records and always looked up to them and stuff. And, and you know, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, uh, and here's Green Day and, and the two surviving Beatles playing together. You know, they were... Ringo, who was being inducted into the Hall of Fame at the same time, asked Green Day to be his, his backing band. And then wow. Paul McCartney came out and joined them. And you could just see, uh, uh, I got kind of misty-eyed. I mean, because, you know, I was with Trey the first time he ever picked up a drumstick. I mean, I was basically say, here, kid, he was 12. And I said, here, here's, a, here's, a set, here's a drumstick, here's how you hit the drum. I mean, I don't know much about drums, but I knew more than he did at the time. And... And here I am a few years, well, 20, 30 years later, and he's sitting there next to Ringo Starr, and I catch one look, and he, you know, like, Trey, is, you know, how, I'm sure you've all seen Trey play. He's like pretty much of a wild man. He was like that even as a little kid. But he just, at one point, he was like, bam, 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 and looks over, and he's like, that's Ringo Starr. I'm playing with Ringo Starr. Uh, <laughs> And then he's like, bam, bam, bam. You know, he's just like a second of awareness. Like, whoa, how did I get here? <laughs> oh, well, I'm here. Might as well make the most of it. And then I saw Billy doing the same thing, you know, playing guitar next to, to Paul McCartney. So, you know, because the, 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 um, Green Day, although they were a different generation, they, like Billy had an older brother who was of the Beatles generation. And, and he, he loved the Beatles music. You can kind of hear it in the early Green Day music. One of, one of Billy's habits, or hobbies rather, was when he first had enough money to have his own studio in his house, was to pl uh, make recordings of Beatles songs where he would play all the parts and, all, and sing all the harmonies. 
And I, I heard a couple of them, and they were like picture perfect. Uh, I mean, he's like, <laughs> you almost don't need the Beatles. Billy could do it all. Oh, my God. So what, 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 a, what an amazing adventure, though, to, to start out, you know, these two kids in a backyard in a low-rent suburb uh, trying to learn how to play in a band. And, and, you know, here they are, 2015, playing on a stage with the biggest, arguably the biggest band in the world ever, or at least what's left of it. And, you know, sometimes dreams come true. I mean, that, that, that's the kind of dream that you probably, unless you got a really good imagination, you don't even bother dreaming of, like, who could imagine? It's a heck of a story. Um, so you mentioned Trey playing in the Lookouts and then, you know, playing in Green Day. What did that, what did that transition look like from him playing in the Lookouts to, to Green Day? And I, I know there was some overlap time, I think, but. A little bit of overlap, not much, um, because the Lookouts were in a chaotic state at the time. We hadn't done anything for a while. Then we got together and made some, made a few recordings that were actually our best work ever. And Billy Joe came in and played lead guitar on them. And I'm really, really proud of those to this day. They're on the reissue of Spy Rock Road. Um, but that was actually when Billy and I have this long running argument about how him and Trey first played together. And, you know, the story, the, the Green Day story is that, you know, they John went away to college and they needed somebody to jam with and Trey had recently moved to, to Berkeley or to near Berkeley. So they started jamming with him. And I'm like, no, Billy, when you came in to the studio, like nine months earlier when we were recording and played lead guitar with the Lookouts and Trey was our drummer. And that's the first time he played with them. And he's like, no, no, I think you're mistaken. And it's like a pointless argument and we will probably never settle it. Um, but the thing is, Trey by that time had developed into uh, one of the better drummers around he would he would be if he were here he would be like one of uh, I mean, like <laughs> I, 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 it was a running joke with us for years after it after he became much more famous with green day but i would say trey i think you're you've become one of the best drummers in the world and again he was like, one of uh, <laughs> and he's up there i don't i don't know enough about drums to to judge um but it was frustrating for him because um, I was in Berkeley. He was up in uh, Northern California where, uh, where he grew up. And our bass player was in Germany studying in, at the university there. And so we, had, we did very little. So I couldn't really begrudge him uh, you know, playing with, with Green Day. But I kind of knew they were just starting to really break loose. They had made their first album already that year. And... I kind of knew that if it worked out, if, if they didn't kill him for being annoying, which which he was, um, yes, I mean, you know, he's probably, I've known him since he was nine years old, and he hasn't changed that much in personality. I mean, he's always been <laughs> a very rambunctious person, and one of the big problems with the lookouts was getting him, him to sit still long enough to, to play, play on a song. Um, but... He learned so quickly. I mean, from the time I gave him his first lesson, within two years he was giving lessons to like advanced jazz musicians and stuff. And this was like four years, five years later. Um, yeah, he was like 17, almost 18 when he joined Green Day. And by that time, he was just an astounding drummer. You, you can hear bits and pieces of it on that green record that you have there, Churchy. Um, you know, he still was learning. He was about 16, I think, when we recorded that, I mean, 15 or 16. But there's parts of it where you're just like, whoa, that's some amazing drumming. Um, and it just kept getting better and better. So when it was only a question, really, of if he could fit in to Green Day. And as it turned out, he fit in very well. The, the three of them were all born the same year, whereas John was two years older and kind of the dad of the band. Now it was like three goofy kids all on the same page. And, um, you know, Trey, I mean, John's a, a competent, decent drummer, but I mean, Billy told me a few years later, I, said, I asked him, what do you think would have happened if John hadn't left the band? 
And he said, well, we probably would have made a couple more records and then broken up. When, you know, we never would have got anywhere near as big. And I, I think that's true. Uh, I mean, the, the record that John plays on, the 39 Smooth, that's one of my favorites, and he, he does a very good job. But there are certain limitations. And with Trey, there's almost no limitations. I mean, that guy could still be, become, be, be becoming a better drummer when he's 80. Um, he's turning uh, 50 later this year. So a lot, of, a lot of room for improvement still. But I remember going to see the first time that he played with Green Day in the, sometime in the autumn of 1990. And I was like really curious to see how this was going to work. I knew it would probably be exciting, but I, you know, it was still a question of how well would they fit together. But within like the first 30 seconds of the first song, I was like, whoa, this is like Green Day on a whole new, in a whole new dimension. And we're probably not getting our drummer back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned that since you mentioned John, I'm gonna throw an extra question in here. Was it on, is it on the back cover or inside sleeve of 39 Smooth? I think it was where there was a letter from John in response oh. to some kind of headhunt. And I just thought how ironic it was that he sent a letter out like that. And then like a couple, three, four years later, Green Day is where they are, you know? You do know the whole thing was fake, right? This, I did not know that. <laughs> he, found, he found that stationery in a dumpster somewhere in San Francisco, <laughs> forged the whole letter. It, it ended up making a lot of trouble for us, actually, because once, I mean, for the first, I mean, we did, we did stuff like that all the time, just messing with uh, corporate logos and stuff. Was, you know, we were punks and nobody was ever going to know about it. But when Green Day started to get a, a bit more popular, you know, the, that record label, uh, IRS, uh, they definitely found out about it. And next thing I know, you're going to get sued and you, you can't put that, you can't keep putting that record out. Uh, you know, their initial demand was that we destroy all copies of the record. Um, they finally settled for me making a public statement and apology like like oh we didn't know any better we were just having a joke the irs never really sent a record uh, sent a letter to green day and um and it was printed in rolling stone i think and, and that was the end of it i i did i had, I had to do a, a lot of that kind of talking ourselves out of trouble with lawyers and, and big companies the uh, the worst was uh converse with you know that that queers t-shirt you've probably all seen with the queers all-stars Mm -hmm. I had it. It fell apart. <laughs> uh, well, the con uh, the Converse company did not really see the humor of that at all. I mean, I try saying, "No, oh, this is giving you all sorts of publicity." I mean, you're you're probably selling lots of more shirts, shoes. They were like, again, destroy all of the shirts, pay us bunches of money, never put that up. And I somehow like, oh, it was just a really small record, just a real. We only printed a few hundred of them we'll never do it again and <laughs> finally yeah they let us they let us get away with it and then i said okay we're not going to print any more of those so of course the queers went and printed thousand i think it was <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't lookout that's so how you do it you're a punk rock man you say fuck you <laughs> another another one there was a um, a famous, uh, I can't think of his name now, Larry, his name, first name was Larry, but uh, he was a famous photographer and w one of his photographs was on the cover of a Mr. T 7 inch uh, called Gun Crazy. And, and the dude, and there was a lot of t-shirts of that too. And the dude's lawyer calls up and again, I had to go through my whole like, oh, well, we're just a little band, just, a, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. And in, in that case, the guy was pretty cool. He says, oh, okay, well, just don't print anymore. Just do the initial run of 3,000 and, and send me a T-shirt and a, and a seven inch and we're cool. <laughs> so he, he was like, I guess I can think of his last name. Uh, he's a pretty famous photographer. Uh, but anyway, he was one of the cool ones. But basically, yeah, I had a, one of my bigger headaches because none of the bands really cared. They're like, ha, 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 nothing's going to happen to us. But once we got big enough that the com other companies noticed us, it, ha it happened to us. We got a uh, we got a video question from one of our uh, fellow Wolves of the Pit, one of the bosses here, and uh, I think uh, Trevor's got that for us. 
Hey, Larry. Thanks for being on Rules of the Pit with us tonight, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there with you live tonight. Um, but the big question that I had for you was about one of my personal favorite bands, Filth, and how that worked out for you having such a, a divergent band to the rest of the Lookout repertoire through the, from the late 80s through the 90s. Um, what what gave you the interest in giving those guys the Shit Split album with Blatz, you know, two bands that were relatively uh, divergent from the rest of your roster? Um, how did that work out for the label? Um, I know how it worked out for the listeners. I'm very thankful that you, you put that album out. Um, so yeah, what was that like for you? And do you have any relationship with those guys today? Sorry that I kind of laughed out loud when you mentioned filth. And I have to explain what I was laughing at is you kind you kind of look a lot like a professor of some, of, you know, some like kind of, I don't know if you are or not. He's actually, know. he's actually a very, uh, uh, he's actually a very accomplished chef. Accomplished what, sorry? He's an accomplished chef. Oh, chef. Well, I, you know, you just look like a really intellectual professor type. And so I, it was like, uh, what, filth? Okay. Um, I, I need to kind of explain. It will, maybe it will help you understand what the whole lookout aesthetic and scene was. I mean, we were most famous for like catchy sing-along pop punk, but it was certainly not limited to that. Basically, we were the label that you know, hoped to represent everything from the East Bay. And if you listen to the first Neurosis album, that definitely does not sound like a La 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 Green Day kind of harmony sing-along. And yet the two bands co-headlined their record release show, the, the Neurosis Word is Law album and Green Day 39 Smooth. Like they played one, one and a half to the other and, and it was awesome. It was one, it was the biggest show Lookout had ever put on at that point in 1990. Um, similarly, Neurosis around later that year. Are you guys familiar with uh, Chumbawamba? Um, I mean, almost everybody knows I get knocked down. Yeah. But most, most, most people don't know that they were like a kind of an anarchist, uh, political, raggedy, you know, shouty kind of band for a long time before uh, they became big big and famous and um, they played at Gilman with Neurosis and they were just starting to get into their whole dance music thing at that time um, but it was like it was one of my favorite shows too like because we had uh, Chumbawamba playing this like almost like disco music and everybody dancing like crazy and then Neurosis comes on and plays the word is law and everybody's dancing like crazy hardly changed a beat I mean it was just like it flowed together and that's kind of what our scene was like. Um, we did not see a big difference between Blatz and Filth and Operation Ivy and Green Day and Crim Shrine. I mean, most of these guys were, and girls, were friends who knew each other, who hung out at Gilman every week. And in, in fact, uh, Jake, who's like the mouth of uh, Filth, I mean, he was like right up front in the pit every, every Friday and Saturday night. He was like, he would lead like the, the heckling. I mean, that's probably what led to filth was he would be standing there in the front row, like screaming insults at Operation Ivy, you know, ska boys or, 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 or Green Day calling them like, like sellouts and pop stars and stuff. But it was, <laughs> it was meant to be all good natured. And sometimes, especially Op Ivy, they did not really get the joke always. They would get annoyed. But in general, I mean, Gilman was a, you know, a goofy place where people goofed around a lot. And kind of, kind of, Phil's kind of grew out of that. Uh, I, I don't know how many of the members would, would cop to it these days, um, though those who are still around. Um, but most of us understood Phil's as a joke band at first. 
like we're more hardcore than hardcore. Uh, you know, there's a there's a band uh, does a little bit similar of a thing. My my friend Sean and well, actually all of the three of them are my friends in England called Hard Skin, where they started out as a making fun of the super macho hard skin or the, the skinheads who were. So they said, well, we'll just make a really ridiculous skinhead band. And what happened was the skinheads loved them. And in fact, they became massively popular, often with the very people that they were making fun of. And, and sometimes they would even get attacked by anti-skinhead people. Um, and you know, Phil's kind of worked that same way. They, it was everybody was like laughing along with the joke, and then suddenly it wasn't a joke anymore because so many people liked that sound and took it very seriously that the band themselves began taking it more seriously. And but I don't think there was at least at any point while I was there and while I was working with them, there was never really any conflict. Like I would often tease them about how, okay, yeah, I know you're a parody band, and like Jake would be like, no, we're like the real punks, and like, but it was kind of that's how Jake was. He was, you know, you you would never get a totally straight answer out of him, you know. He could be totally serious or he could be totally joking, and it would be very difficult to difficult to tell which was which. In fact, he was usually doing both at the same time, and. I think the same thing was true of uh, of Blatz. They were, they were kind of a half half joke, half really serious, and they made some really great art. And they were, I mean, Blatz. I've, I've, have any of you seen Absolutely Zippo magazine? I can't say that I've no. seen it. Well, go, go to. I think they're on. East, East Bay Punk Digital Archive. I may be mistaken. I know Lookout Magazine is there, but uh, I think Zippo is also. I, uh, if not, it should be. At any rate, um, Zippo, absolutely Zippo, was started by the same kid who was kind of the, if I, to use the term loosely, the, the brains behind Blatz, and the magazine came first. In the same way that Lookout came first before the Lookouts band. And, and it was kind of a, a reaction against like the, 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 clean, the, clean, the shiny, happy, smart punks, as some, some of the people called us, um, where, the guy, I mean, Robert, you know, Robert Eggplant was the kid's name. And he started coming to Gilman on his skateboard when he was 14 and eventually became like one of the major figures there. But the magazine was meant to just like make a mockery of everything. So he would, because he hadn't had a lot of education, he had trouble with grammar and spelling. So he deliberately misspelled everything. Uh, and everybody that he got to contribute would do the same thing. We would, instead of the smart punks, we would be the dumb punks. I mean, I was, I was a regular contributor too. And it was really fun to do the opposite of writing my very serious articles about what is punk and blah, what should punks do? And I just like to write totally goofy stuff. Um, Jesse Michaels did some of the artwork for the covers. He's got a famous cover of, of the, the, the punk, the, the, the cartoon punk Spike Anarchy pouring like uh, bags of heroin into his arm through a, a giant funnel, uh, all, all of which was very ni negative and nihilistic and was all hilarious and not meant to be taken seriously. The, the unfortunate thing is that eventually people did start taking it seriously. I, I, mean, I think you can enjoy both Phils and Blatz just laughing along with them and singing along with them and dancing along with them. But some punks did begin to take them almost like as a guide for how to be really punk. And uh, I'm not sure that always had good results, unfortunately. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't, uh, for a minute, regret working with them. Uh, they were just one aspect of our scene. We were all buddies, and we all played in cool bands, and um, there was no reason why we shouldn't be all on the same label. So bringing it back to the early days again, um, 
it seems to me looking at that time that operation ivy was just instantly loved by the bay area crowds they you know Pretty their close. contemporaries were maybe you know you mentioned this a little bit you know lagging behind a little bit um what do you think set them apart well first first i'll have to make a slight correction um because they were uh, actually isocracy was the first gilman band to really start to attract an audience and they were kind of rivals good you know good natured rivals but rivals nonetheless with what Operation Ivy, but Isocracy had started a few months earlier. Um, and when we first put out the seven inches on Lookout, um, the the Operation Ivy and the Isocracy seven inch were basically neck and neck for for most of the first year. Hmm. And in fact, I got yelled at later because I used to tease them and say, "Oh, look, I, I, Isocracy pulled ahead of you this week. Are you, hopefully, you might better sell some more record." And they they told me sometime later that that really used to bother them and i felt i felt bad about it because i was just teasing um but you know isocracy had like they were kind of like what they say call a, a one-trick pony i mean they had a gimmick they were they were entertaining very entertaining band a lot of fun but they didn't know how to do a lot of other stuff whereas the guys in operation ivy i mean they were accomplished musicians and songwriters before long before the band even existed. I mean, especially Tim and Matt, they'd been playing together since they were like 11 and they were about 21 when the band started, when, when Operation Ivy started. Um, so yeah, they were the, the kind of, I mean, the kind of thing that only happens once in a very long while, like, like what some people refer to the expression is lightning in a bottle. It's just like, wait, I, did I just see that? Could this possibly be happening? Well, yeah, I think it is. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm alive. I'm awake, and it, it's happening. Like, uh, and one thing I remark on in my book, where I say, the very first time I saw them, they had been playing about three months by that time, because I was away when they first started playing. Um, it was like they started singing, and everybody singing along, including me, even though I did not know a single song of their. I'd never heard any of their. Well, I'd heard a couple of demo songs, but. I did not really know their songs at all, and I'm singing along, and so was everybody else. It was just, and that happened wherever they went, all over the country when they went on tour. Um, they just, every, it was like, you put them on stage, it's like flipping a switch, and, and the whole uh, place becomes a rocket ship blasting off into the next dimension. It, um, you, you can't, um, I don't know. Some, some sometimes, a lot of times, there will be more people from the audience on the stage in, than there was in the band. Sometimes the members of the band would have to get off stage and get into the pit to play there. Um, but whatever it was, the whole the place would uh, just go completely wild, and people that you would never think of, like jumping up and down and running around and singing and screaming and stuff, they're all doing it. I mean. Uh, it was impossible not to. I have another description in my in my uh, book about how when we played with them at their last Gilman show in 1989, right after their record came out, my band, The Lookouts, was the played right before them, and um, so I was still on, um, uh, you know, on on stage, just watching. Well, even when we played, it was like this, this amazing effect because that place was so crowded it was like a thousand people in a 250 capacity hall and and i was kind of just like in another world um and i'm like on stage like scared half to death like what do i do now i mean i can't i've never played for this many people in such an intense thing and i think well i guess i'm here now i guess i gotta do it and i just blam hit the first chord of living behind bars and it was like my image of all these people was like a bunch of heads, like from floor to ceiling, all stacked up on top of each other. And it was like I had taken a cue, a cue stick and piled a, pu a cue ball into the middle of them and they, they all went blam, ricocheting in every direction and just like bouncing like crazy for the next half hour. And I had never seen or experienced anything like that before in my life. And then right after we finished, Operation Ivy came on, and it was like a hundred times that. <laughs> so 
I don't know. That's what it is like. You know, it, it, there's a very good chance that Lookout never would have come into being if it weren't for Operation Ivy. I mean, they, they probably deserve as much credit as anybody, including myself, because that first time I saw them, uh, I as soon as they finished playing, like Tim, who was already a friend of mine from from Gilman, walked up and said, "How are you? What did you think of us?" And I said, well, "I want to do a record with you guys, or do you want to guys want to make a record?" And you know, and it just popped out of my mouth without having an idea what I was doing. I didn't have a record label back then. <laughs> I'd been kicking the head the idea around in my head for a, a few months, like it would be cool to have a record label, but like most good ideas. I, I probably never would have done anything about it. It would have just faded away. But the minute I saw them and saw what that what they did to the crowd and what they did themselves, what they created on stage, you know, I just said, well, this has to be on a record. And who, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? And so Lookout had to happen. And that was sometime in August of 1987. And the rest was history, I guess. But uh, you know, and like Tim told me years later, like we thought you were crazy. We 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 said, God, we don't want to see our friend lose all his money, but we really want to be on a record. So you know, we said, Oh well, what the heck? Let's try it. <laughs> so Operation Ivy being um, one of those pivotal points that you know started lockout. Uh, now that there's been this little mini op ivy reunion i'm sure you've seen the video with jesse and and tim uh how do you feel about the chances of a of a full show or a tour would you be in favor of that or not um well it's, i have i have very mixed feelings but the most important thing is it's none of my business what they want to do um i i'm not a big fan of reunions personally, but that in some, to some sense is probably because I'm old and I've already seen a lot of the bands that other people want to see because they were never, weren't around when those bands were. Uh, but I haven't really seen many reunions that I thought were good. In fact, the closest I ever saw was the, the Blondie, the first Blondie reunion. I, I saw Blondie in 1978 and then they had a reunion. I. I can't remember when it was. It was in England anyway, but it was, they were better than ever. I mean, they had learned to play their instruments much better than they had back then. Everything was perfect. Uh, the sound was incredible, all of my favorite songs and stuff. And even that did not, it didn't bum me out, but it just left me kind of like, eh. And it was like listening to a really good record uh, over a really good stereo system. It did not have, I mean, the first time I saw them, they were playing in a small club and they had a really small amps and it was it was really like watching somebody play at a basement show and and yet it was like i i remember i remembered them forever from that show they were that it was just like you know four kids playing in a in a basement and had a, had a very thin sound but they loved the mu songs were so good and the music was so good and the performance was just like well it was I even they were just like we're just playing you know and and that could never be matched by them playing with all this top top level equipment and 30 more years of experience etc cetera, etc cetera. it just wasn't the same and you know watching that video of Tim and uh and Jesse I had a little bit of the same feeling I mean at first I was like wow they haven't lost a step. They're just like right as good as they ever were, if not better. But it didn't have quite the same magic. I, I don't think most people, especially people who never saw Operation Ivy, would would know the difference or care, because they're they're playing all their favorite songs and they're playing them very well. Um, but and. I mean, also because they're such a special band that if anybody could do a great reunion, it would probably probably be them. But the thing is, you know, almost all of us who saw the original Operation, I mean, all of us, we, you know, that, that last Gilden show was the, 
biggest show by far that they ever played. Usually they played for a couple hundred people. Uh, there's no way they could do a reunion without playing for tens or even hundreds of thousands of people on giant stages. You know, it would be hard for me to begrudge them if, you know, they could make millions of dollars and not everybody in that band is, is rich or even well off. So, you know, how could I say to them, you shouldn't do that? Again, once again, it's none of, none of my business. So I'm sure it would be an amazing thing to see um, if they don't do it. Um, you know, there's lots of videos of them playing back in the 80s. Um, you can see that and get kind of a sense. Or you could start your own band and try to do better. <laughs> Absolutely. Nope. When, uh, Larry, when you're feeling musically inspired these days, what, uh, how does it come out? How do you, uh, do you calculate guitar work, jam and free? Do you dabble at all anymore? And do you miss playing on stage? Mm, every time I do play on stage, I say never again. Um, <laughs> it's, it's still kind of stressful for me. Uh, always has been. There was only a handful of times when I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, to me right now is kind of like in the, a period before most of you were born, I assume, with the mid seventies, uh, where kind well, of. I'm a little, I'm a little older than that, but yeah. <laughs> I'm talking like basically sort of 1973, 74 up till about 75, 76. And it was like the old scene the the hippie music the acid rock the glam rock had all faded away or at least was fading away it was had lost its energy and the seeds of punk were being sown i mean in a way the new york dolls had some of that and the ramones took over for them but we hadn't really heard most of us hadn't really heard them yet so there was this it was this feeling like gosh nothing's happening and there was a lot happening, of course, but nothing's happening in my world. So we're just waiting for something to happen, to change, to, to come along. And for me personally now, this is very much resembles that, that time. I mean, there's still lots of music being made, um, but none of it is really connecting with me. Um, I, I mean, I can tell just by the fact that all you guys are here and that you have lots of people listen to your show and ask questions and stuff. There's lots of people that probably think music is better than ever and are enjoying the heck out of it. Um, and nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's great. Um, but I'm in a holding pattern. I've had a couple of periods like that in my life where um, I think there was another one in the uh, early 60s, right before the Beatles came out where I was just like, eh, everything's kind of, you know, I mean, there was Motown, which was, I loved. And there was the girl, the tail end of the girl, girl groups and doo-wop, which I loved just as much, but it was fading away. And the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and that stuff hadn't happened yet. So there was, it was you know, it was only a, a year or so, but when you're 16 or 15, a year is a really long time. Nowadays, a year is, kind of like uh, a week. And that's something you discover as you, you probably are already discovering, but as you get older, like time like flies faster and faster. It's, it's actually a, a, a real sound uh, scientific principle based on the theory of relativity, depending on how much time you have left in your life, uh, time will pass either more quickly or slowly. Like, like to a 10 year old, almost all of your life is still ahead of you. So you're like, wow, a year, that's forever. When, you, when you're like 70 or 80, and you might have a few years left, you're like, well, a year, can't waste that. Oops, what happened there? It's gone. You know, it's, I find it interesting. You're in uh, Singapore right now, right? I am, yes. No, it, what brought you to Singapore as, as Singapore? And is it an appreciation of culture or blink twice if you need help? Hmm. It's a very uh, comfortable place to be, um, especially especially this time of year. Like the, the coldest it's been all, all year has been for the Canadians, 23 degrees, and for the Americans, like 70, 
74 or something, 70, 73, 74. That's, that's as cold as it ever gets. Um, um, for about the last, oh, quite a few years, I've been very much a student of Asian culture in general and Chinese culture in particular. Uh, Singapore is about, it's, it's an independent country, but it's about 70% Chinese. And so there's a lot of Chinese culture and Malayan and uh, Indian and a few white people as well. Um, but I've been traveling to China, to Hong Kong, to Japan, uh, Macau, Korea, and Singapore for the last several years and spending as much time as I can here. Um, I'm studying the language. I'm learning a lot about, uh, well, I've, I've, I did this back in college, like bef long before Lookout or long before Punk Rock even. And I'm just, now that I'm older and have free time, I'm just like, ba that's like the ba basically the most serious thing I do is is learn learn Chinese and learn Chinese culture. And so if I, if it was because of the pandemic, Singapore is the only Chinese, predominantly Chinese place that I can, can go, China, and Hong Kong are, and Japan are all closed uh, to to foreigners, and and you know I like being able to wear shorts all year round and uh, and t-shirts. And well, I guess also, in your travels you've picked up some Mandarin, probably. Um, I I first started studying Chinese, uh, which Mandarin is one of the is the main dialect of, of Chinese. There are there are many dialects. Not all of them are even understandable to other people. But Mandarin, or is in China they call it Putonghua, which means the common tongue. It's the, it's the one that the government has decided everybody's going to speak. And I started studying that at college back in the seventies, and then kind of became a flake and dropped out and didn't finish the course. And so about. Uh, 2015, I decided to take a trip around the world, ending up in China for the first time. My plan had been go to go to China way back in the 70s, and it never happened because I got diverted by punk rock and stuff. So I started restudying Chinese. I had forgotten almost everything, but I started restudying it, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, and I'm probably up to the level now of maybe a, a kind of a slow middle schooler. Um, <laughs> I can, I can read and write to some extent. Um, I take classes on Zoom, and in fact, that's what I was doing right before I came on with you, was doing my homework and writing answers to some Chinese questions. But the, uh, the, the short answer is yes, it's uh, the, the main, the most commonly form of China, spoken form of Chinese is Mandarin. And similarly here in Singapore, the, Although it's an English-speaking country primarily, um, uh, almost everybody that's of Chinese ancestry also speaks uh, Mandarin. And the government has said, look, you all got to speak the same kind of Chinese or else you're just going to not understand each other and you'll be fighting with each other. So, they, uh, so basically, they all started teaching them in Mandarin in school. Now they all speak Mandarin. It's uh, much more efficient than the way that the government works in the US. Where, <laughs> well, we can't tell people what to, to do, so, so we'll, we'll just let them all hate each other. <laughs> That's a, that was a good dig. I like that. We get it to uh, we got we got we got our we got three uh, we got what we call lightning round questions. There are three questions that we we like to ask and uh, of every guest. So, uh, Trev, can you kick us off? Absolutely, uh, Larry. In the uh, the past few years. Uh, what two bands have really caught your attention or maybe maybe they're not new bands maybe they're bands that you've enjoyed your whole life but you've really really been into them for the last couple of years in the last couple of years i there's been a pandemic i have not been to a gig in over two years and i'm afraid i can't <laughs> i'm sorry I, I, there, there there haven't been any I have to be honest with you. Um, I think the, I, I may get myself in some trouble with this because apparently they're they're controversial for one reason or another. I did see uh, this band, the Interrupters, Interrupters on on video, and I thought they're. I mean, the minute, first time I saw them, I said, "Wow, that's really good," 
And then people started saying, oh yeah, but they got dodgy politics or they're, they're too clean cut or they're too whatever. And I don't know, I haven't watched them enough to, to know for sure if that's true. Um, but they did seem to have a lot of energy and, and talent. So I gotta, I gotta, I gotta say that, but I, I wouldn't, I can't, I'm not, I don't know them well enough to say I'm a fan or not a fan. <laughs> All right. Well, I got another question for you. Is a beer? Um, yeah. Uh, what social issue or cause is 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 uh, in your crosshairs these days? Um, trying to prevent the the end of the world. Um, <laughs> so basically, I mean, I know everybody else is. Uh, everybody's like all climate change, and I. I've, I've been aware of that. I had a class at Berkeley in climate change back like 30 some years ago. Uh, one of the professors there was like one of the pioneers in that field. So I'm, I'm aware of it. Um, and obviously n lots of stuff needs to be done. But my biggest by far thing is that I'm really, really fearful that the, there are people in the United States government who want to push us into war with China and or Russia. I, I don't even understand what that, well, I do understand, but it's basically the United States, which I'm not disloyal to the United States, but I mean, I grew up there most of my life, but, and they've done a lot of great things, but right now they're kind of like a dying society. They lost much of their, of their motive, uh, they, they lost the plot. Let's just put it that way. They're kind of, kind of like a band that doesn't know how to make good records anymore. So they just start turning out any old thing in hopes that it will sell. But they're very fearful of losing their position at number one. So they're basically like, so we have to stop China from passing this up. And so they're like, um, this is a hard thing for me because I'm also big on newspapers and journalism and media. I've been reading things like the New York Times all my life. I won a journalism award from them when I was still in high school in the 60s. They print like lies, just like constant nonsense and garbage about, about China trying to whip up the people that like, oh, we have to fight with them. We have to have a war. There is no way that such a war could come out well for, for anybody. My dad told me, he, he, he was a baby uh, at the time of World War One, but he said they did the same thing then. Like for years ahead of World War One, everything in the newspaper was like, the, "This was the Germans are they're terrible. They're killing babies. They're this was not the Nazis. This was just the regular Germans before long before the Nazis." Um, you know, basically, my like my grandmother who was part German, she had to change her n name because people would say, "Oh, you're one of those baby killers," and and it's he said, you know, it's just kind of the same thing. Most of what you read in the United States about China is just not true. And yet, you know, the Chinese have been like under attack from the West for a hundred and some years. They're paranoid and you keep pushing them. They will push back and nobody wins that kind of a war. And yet I see us drifting in that direction. So one of the reasons that I want to know as much as I can about China and about the language so I can communicate with people there as well as people in my own country is to build kind of a bridge and say, look, you guys have more you could do to help each other and to, show, to teach each other than you could ever gain by destroying each other. I don't know if I'm probably too old and probably too limited in my abilities to accomplish that, but that's by far the most important thing to me because otherwise, you know, all these other social issues are are like not going to matter because we're going to probably be back to to the Stone Age after the after like a all out world war. It wasn't that that Einstein that says I don't know what uh, World War Three will be fought with, but World War Four will be sticks and stones. Yeah. <laughs> it's stuff. attributed to him. I don't know if he said it, but there you go. Yeah, a lot of stuff is attributed to to him. Uh, every, everything is relative, including relativity. I I, I made part of that up, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I do a lot of business with China, and I, I can say from firsthand experience that uh, it's been nothing but a pleasant experience. I mean, it really has just been absolutely incredible. Like you said, we have so much that we can help each other with. And, and just in my small little realm of what I do, I've experienced that. So, Have you, have you spent actual time in China? 
I have not, but in my line of business, I do a lot of apparel and printing and, and merchandise and that's what I do. So we're, we're planning over the next course of the next couple of years to go out and try to obviously COVID pushed us back a couple of years, but um, they have conventions where we can go and find new vendors and find new opportunities to do business with China. Um, yeah, there's one, there's a, a giant fair in the city of Guangzhou, or it's called, also called Canton, um, uh, every, every year where the people come from all over the world to meet with merchants and stuff. If you ever get a chance to go to that, Guangzhou is an amazing city in southern China of about 14 million people. That's, that's small by Chinese standards, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> both like my this. kids, both my kids studied Mandarin in high school and they both got to go to Guangzhou. So yeah, I've. I look love the city, but I also also love Shanghai and Beijing, which are in the twenty million something. But uh, the the reason that I, uh, I I asked if you'd been there is because this is something that I really wish I could get through to. I mean, Americans think that everybody's there living in slave labor colonies and stuff. The quality of life there, in many ways, makes America look pretty pretty bad. I mean, it's hard to believe because America is like we're Americans, we do everything best, and we're number one. Well, go to China, you will not find any homeless colonies. You will not find any neighborhoods where you're afraid to, to walk in the middle of the night, or even if you're a woman. Like I, where I used to stay in a kind of a back streets of Beijing, like you'd see little old ladies at two o'clock in the morning just walking down the street, uh, down an alley, or like a dark alley, just la 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 singing to themselves. Nothing's gonna happen. This is like a kind of freedom that Americans cannot imagine. It just does not exist in most places, especially big cities in, in America. So, um, you know, not everybody in China is as, as rich as everybody in America, but there is almost nobody that is desperately poor like in America. Um, so these are, these are things, you know, no, no country is perfect and every country has areas that can be improved. But for people to be believed blindly because the media told them, uh, oh, this is the, what it's like, that makes me very sad. I, 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 list, I have a, a little box that lets me listen to all the Chinese TV and stations as well. And they also have an English language channel where they tell their side of the story. And to be honest, they're, they're tied, <laughs> they do less bullshitting than the American one does. It's like, CNN does does way more. CNN just repeats what the government tells them to say. The Chinese, well, so does the Chinese state uh, channel, but they have a different approach. I studied Chinese history a lot in in college. Uh, their idea is like they they'll only um, they'll only tell true things. They they won't if they if there's something that bad about their country, they just won't mention it. But if they do say it, it's probably true. Whereas Amer in America, they just say a whole bunch of lies and a whole bunch of true stuff. And, it, and it's up to you to figure it out. You know, like, this, like they say with the old expression, throwing a bunch of spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. Um, like if you listen to any news program about China and America, and at least half of it is going to be complete nonsense and lies, and some parts of it will be true. But there's no way unless you've traveled there and no... Chinese people and know something about their history, there's no way you could possibly know which is which. So in a way, I kind of prefer the, the Chinese system, although, you know, you could accuse them, they only tell the good news and leave out the bad news. Don't anyway, they also hope, have a, an, a real emphasis on family over there too, Larry? Like they take care of their elders? Uh, family is, is very strong and it's not just like your mom and dad, it's like your whole family yeah uh, there, there's there's like only a, a a couple hundred names in all of china last names so almost everybody they have a a, a thing called the lao bai xing which means the the hundred um the hundred old names which uh, based on the idea that originally there was only a, a hundred families in china this is going, going back five thousand years or so but the, now that means like you know the the common people, the regular people, the the masses, is the is the is the, the, the hundred the hundred old names, um, but yes, there's there's a more of a connection to, not just to grand, mom and dad, but grandma and grandpa and uncles and cousins and uh, uh, 
but, uh, but that extends also to society in general. Like, you know, in America, you're, you, it's very hard to get everybody to agree on anything. It's like, oh, are you from that political party? Or are you from that church? No, I can't talk to you. Uh, it's much more the case in China, like, well, we're all Chinese, so we have to pull together. We may disagree on some things, but we have to, to pull together. And they also have a thing called uh, guanxi, which means connections, or it's kind of like our network. Uh, Japan has something like that too. It's, and we learned about this when we were studying um, Japanese economics at college. It's, it's like basically, and I use this in Lookout a lot, and then Brett Gurowitz from Epitaph told me he used it too with, with his label. It's the idea is that you don't always look for the cheap, fast, quick deal, no matter whether it's quality or not, but instead you try to form good relationships. Like, like when I was running Lookout, I'd always get all these calls like, oh, we can make your CDs five cents cheaper. Um, you should switch to our company. And the Japanese or Chinese principal would be like, yes, but I have a long-standing relationship with this company and with this man. And if something goes wrong, I can call him up and say, hey, that last batch was wrong. Can you fix it? And they will fix it as opposed to some, you know, bargain basement cheap thing. So that 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 is called guanxi, having, having that kind of connection to to people and long-standing relationships where you know you can trust them. Um, and, you know, it's it's very much also like a family where you, you know, like you not, I know this doesn't always work, but generally you like to think if you're doing business with your brother or your dad or your mom, they'll, they're probably not going to cheat you then. You can talk to them at least. And, you know, Chinese society does work a lot better, a lot more like that. Plus there's the whole communist thing where there's still people around old, my age and older who remember the revolution and how desperate China was not that long, you know, in the 1940s, people were starving to death regularly. The life expectancy in China was like 37 years old, you know, people that you could expect to live. Now it's more than doubled since that time. And, and they, so they're basically like, yeah, China ain't perfect, but it's getting better and getting better fast. I had this Chinese guy in Shanghai come up to me and said, can I ask you a question? Um, and it turns out he was a cop. And I thought, oh, am I in trouble now? But he just wanted to chat. And he said, now I have, I have traveled twice to your country, to New York City and to San Francisco. And I have, I'm very curious because I was always taught that the United States is the richest country in the history of the world. And so I, can you explain to me why is your infrastructure so terrible? And, and it, it's, it's true. You get off the, the Shanghai subway, get on a, and go to the airport, which is like a spaceport, come to New York and get onto the New York subway. It's like traveling back in time 100 years to this like broken down old dangerous rattle trap. And, and I, had, I had a friend visit me from China too once in New York, and I was like, yeah, well, if you're going to take the subway, be careful not to go to that neighborhood and don't get off of that. And he was like, but why? And I said, well, because it's kind of dangerous. And he said, but why would the authorities allow it to be dangerous? It just did not make sense to, to him, uh, to, to Chinese people in general. They say, why would you allow people to run around with guns and knives and stabbing people and killing people? It just doesn't happen there. It's just they've come to accept that the society works. And... They don't understand why we would have anything else like that. I don't know. I've been all over China on the high-speed rail that goes like 180 miles an hour and and like like almost flawlessly. The, you know, I've been on the subway on, underneath their cities where the internet is so good on the subway that you can like watch TV on your on your phone, and, and people do. And and then, and then I come back to America and I'm like, this place is a dump. Uh, and it's <laughs> It's really disconcerting because the first time I left America in the 1970s, I went to Europe. Back then, everybody, you know, America was leading the world and we would come back from Europe and like, oh, thank God, now we'll have all the modern conveniences again. And it's completely changed now. Now it's like, or even just from, from Canada, when I was a kid, Canada was very poor and we used to have to bring things over to the relatives that they couldn't get in Canada. 
now it's like when I come back from Canada to the U.S., it's like, oh, end of the nice place and back into the slums. It's, it's, really, it's really disheartening. I mean, I grew up in Detroit, which at one time was like a huge thriving city and which now, of course, is, has lost a, most of its population and in much, many, many parts of it are wasteland. And stuff like that, you're like, how does it happen? It's like, well, it's kind of like a person. You know, you ever have a friend that like started doing drugs or drinking too much and that kind of ended up on Skid Row or ODN or stuff, you know, and you're like, but I knew that guy. We were best friends in school. We used to talk about everything. And he was so bright and so optimistic and so full of promise. And now he's like a bum in the gutter. How could that happen? Well, it can happen to countries too. Because countries are just collections of people, ultimately. All right, Larry, I've got the last lightning round question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I do tend to go on a bit. At, That's uh, okay. Went, no problem at all. So I only fine with that. I got this little key on my back, and if you just wind it up, I just like. <laughs> <laughs> so at Rules of the Pit, we say the main rule of the pit is to pick people up when they fall. In keeping with that ideal, what would be a rule you would add? Um, it might be a little elaborate, but um, always be conscious of other people and be, um, you know, if you can, if, if at any time you can, even if it means going slightly out of your way to make somebody else's life a little easier or at least not getting in their way or interfering with them, um, even if it just means like standing on one side of the escalator so that somebody else who wants to walk past can do it, it doesn't cost you anything. It's like the the smallest little thing, and yet it makes somebody else's life easier. You know, same like letting somebody cross the street in front of you, or if they were there first, letting them cross in front of you. These are very little things, and yet if you if you just, you know, so many times when, when people don't do it, you just say, all it would have taken is just move, your, move a, a foot in one side or the other, and everybody would be happier. Uh, Multiply that by all the millions and billions of people in the world, uh, you know, it would, uh, I would like to see that happen. And I try to practice that in my daily life. I'm not far from perfect. And sometimes I want to clobber somebody who doesn't do it, but I usually, <laughs> no, I usually, thankfully, I usually restrain myself from doing or even saying anything to people who are being unconscious jerks because we all learn at our own pace. And, I was an unconscious jerk for a lot of my own life, so I don't want to be too hard on anybody else who's still working that program. Um, I think we should add that to the rules of the pit. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, Larry, um, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I'm, I know I speak for all of us when i say that you don't know that. that for sure you want to take a oh poll? he's definitely speaking for me uh, all yeah. right let's take a yeah. poll boys <laughs> that's, that's, um, that's, that's how democracy starts to fail is when one guy thinks he knows what all the other people want <laughs> that's, that's true Canadian. you know what when that's, those when, when you're true. part of a collective mind it actually works out in favor yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> well, I'm happy to have been here and I'm happy to have not ruined anybody. I don't think I've ruined anybody else's day or said anything that offended anybody too much. No, no, no. Oh. no.